He was an exquisite stylist with the bat. He was tough and shrewd, but always gracious. He was an inspiration to his countrymen. A natural leader who grew to become one of the game's greatest statesmen, Frank Worrell, is one of ESPN's legends of cricket. December the 14th, 1960, the most famous test match of all time reached its climax. Meckham is run out, and the match has finished in a tie. First in test history, and a fitting end to one of the greatest test matches of all. The West Indies, led by Frank Worrell, snatched a tie against Australia. Years ago, in a situation like that, West Indies, West Indians would have given up. But with Frank Worrell leading the team, he got us again and he says, now look, let's come on, let's buckle down, we're still in this game. And that was the difference. Worrell thought he could win the game. Um, he never at any stage um, went purely defensive. Like, he still played attacking cricket. He was still believed that we only had to make one mistake and we were, we, and we were gone. Davidson run out for 80. Largely forgotten in people's memories of that extraordinary match, is the fact that Worrell himself made 65 in each innings. Worrell, 65 in both innings, is probably overshadowed by Sobers because Sobers played an absolutely magnificent innings of tremendous flair. Um, on the other hand, uh, Worrell was the man who stayed with him uh, and enabled him to complete his innings. He certainly, as a batsman, let alone as a captain, played a very significant part in the, in the tied test. We came in at a time when things were fairly tight and Australia was right on top. And Frank came in and he joined me and came down and had a few words with me and said, well, we got to stay here. We got to try and get as many runs as we can. We got to put our heads down. And that's what we did. Worrell was a stylist and superb technician with the bat. Frank Worrell was a stylist, and I can still remember one cover drive he, he played, and it went between cover and extra cover for four. But where Worrell had played it, he's, the follow through, and not only that, but he finished on one knee as he did it. And, and honest to goodness, like if you had to remember one shot, Jerry Alexander still says that that is the greatest moment he's ever known in cricket. He said, I've seen it all. Beautiful player. Uh, a, a good stroke maker, beautiful cover drive, no, a very, very good player, a very good batsman, and a very handy bowler too, and a first class bloke too. He also made useful contributions with the ball, evolving from a left arm finger spinner into a medium pacer of skill and guile. He could bowl slow or quick. He actually started as a spin bowler, but when he started playing league cricket in England, uh, bowling left hand, he he learnt to bowl fast medium stuff because that was what got him, I mean he was a professional cricketer in league cricket and that was the bread and butter. So he evolved into a cricketer that by 1957 he was opening the batting and the bowling for the West Indies at the same time. But Frank Worrell made his greatest impact on the field with the art of captaincy. He was preeminently a batsman, uh, very correct, um, very capable, a good bowler, um, a good field, but it was really as a person that, uh, that Worrell had an impact on the game. Sir Frank Worrell was well respected around the entire Caribbean because of the way he led himself, the way he led his life, the way he dealt with the West Indies team, the way he kept on thinking about the West Indies as a region and not just about any particular one part of the West Indies. Frank Worrell made his test debut in 1947-48 at home against England, making 97 and 28 not out. In his second test, he made 131 not out. Worrell was a, a test cricketer from day one. I mean, he'd already scored 
um, 300 in an uh, uh, inter-island game. So everyone knew he was a great player. And he, he made it a mark, his mark immediately through that series was their leading batsman. Worrell joined Radcliffe in the Lancashire League in 1948 as a professional. Later that year, he refused to tour India in protest of the pittance black players were expected to play for. Worrell was conscious of the politics of black and white in, in, in West Indian cricket. And in 1948, he did refuse to tour. And I think that was certainly a factor in, in, in subsequent you know, improvement in black cricketers' conditions. The 1950 tour of England unearthed one of cricket's most illustrious batting lineups, Worrell, Walcott, and Weeks, the three Ws. Well, I think that's a phase in history which perhaps we won't see again, where you have three cricketers born within a square mile of each other, within a year of each other, uh, uh, Frank, Frank Worrell being the, the eldest, then Everton Weeks born a year after him, and then Clyde Walker a year after him. In the island of Barbados, all with uh, the surname beginning with the same letter, the Ws. Everton Weeks, specialist batsman, shots all round the wicket, quite a diminutive character. Uh, Clyde Walcott actually kept wicket for the West Indies in several test matches. Big, bustling man, very powerful striker of the ball, absolutely murderous hitter. And uh, Frank Worrell, very much a caresser of the ball, um, tall, quite willowy, and also uh, opened the bowling at various times for the West Indies. Worrell, who's a, a slightly lazy looking feline character who moved well in the field and had the most graceful batting style of uh, any of the three W's. The other two were absolute killers, Weeks and uh, Walcott. Uh, Worrell killed you just with beautiful grace and cuts and pushes and drives. And they'd hit the boundary before you even know, knew that they'd gone off the bat. The third test of the 1950 series at Trent Bridge belonged to Frank Worrell. After taking three wickets with his left arm fast medium bowling, he played one of the most dominant innings of the era, scoring 261. In England in 1950, the West Indies made a huge impression. Pre-war, they, they, George Headley and Constantine, you know, they, had, they, they were individuals, but as a team, they, were, they weren't in the same class as England. And suddenly in 1950, they beat them. And then at Trent Bridge, Worrell played one of the great innings of Test cricket. He scored 261, and he got them in a hurry and with great style. It was a display of batsmanship that I don't think English career crowds had seen before, because he was a West Indies player, absolute top class, winning, a, winning games and dominating England bowling. And uh, that was where he made his reputation. In 1951, the West Indies toured Australia with Frank Worrell rated the equal of any batsman in the world. However, over the next few years, Worrell was less consistent with the bat. His priorities were changing. He pursued a degree in sociology at Manchester University. And it was almost like for the, the mid-50s, cricket took a back seat. He went to Manchester Uni and studied economics and sociology. And in a sense, this is where it, the great tragedy of his early death, because I think he was preparing himself to have an influence outside the world of cricket. Despite his obvious leadership quality, Worrell was consistently overlooked for the West Indian captaincy. There was a tremendous bias when I started playing against a, a black fellow captaining the West Indies, and they were, they, they, uh, they, it, was, it was taken to what, what uh, people like CLR James would say, absurd lengths and so on and so forth. And you can argue all that, but, but forget all that. The point is that a barrier was there. And, and, and Frank Worrell let that barrier with ever so much to spare. Frank Worrell was put forward by the likes of CLR James as the natural uh, successor as captain um, to Jerry Alexander and eventually he did take over and it was a big responsibility. Uh, the previous authorities had been reluctant to appoint a black man as full-time captain but they couldn't have chosen a better man because Frank was very intelligent, very sensitive, uh, of course, a wonderful cricketer, um, and knew what was going on and knew that this was a telling moment in the history of West Indies cricket. 
And so in late 1960, Frank Worrell, the first full-time black West Indian captain, was to lead a group of emerging Caribbean cricketers to Australia. It was Worrell's brilliant and natural leadership that was to mold them into one of the great sides in test history. So Frank Worrell was the, what really was the one who gelled West Indies uh, together and came along at a time when West Indies had a number of really outstanding young players, a lot of talent, Sobers, Kenhai, Hall, um, Conrad Hunt had come in as well, Seymour Nurse, a number of young players, but they needed to be gelled into a unit. We knew that Frank um, was going to be a very, very good captain. We knew that he was going to lead the team very well because we all had believed in him. And once you have a captain like that, you, you find that the team will always play together. The 1960-61 series revived the game in Australia. The West Indies team boasted any number of outstanding players, but it had underachieved as a team. Worrell set about the task of bringing his men together. In the past, West Indies teams have never really played as a team. We played as individuals because we came from so, much different, so many different islands. And there was a lot of insularity in the West Indies in those days. But when Frank took over the team, he started to mold the team together and, 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 and build it into a team. Sir Frank Warren still left a great legacy that I think Clive Lloyd again took the baton up from him and carried on. Thinking of the region and not just thinking about one small area where you are from. Because I think a lot of people compared Clive Lloyd to Sir Frank Worrell and said perhaps it was just his following, although we had a lot of captains between Sir Frank Worrell and Clive Lloyd. Because Clive Lloyd again was another captain that I think thought about the region and not just Guyana where he was from. And I think that helped the West Indies team a great deal. Nobody knows just how much in the skills that Worrell had as a captain on and off the field to get his team up to the standards they were and I, I really believe they can talk about all the things that happened afterwards. I think Worrell made these fellows believe that they were a great team. I think that 60-61 series after the dullness of the late 50s really for my generation uh, it reignited cricket. All of a sudden we could see again you know what fun it could be, what a wonderful game it could be, fun but at the same time tense and, you know, a game of enormous skill. Cricket was at a, a turning point, I suppose. Um, you know, we had, we'd had the period through the 50s when, like when Hutton Len came here with his, with his pace bowlers, and you know, they were bowling 62 overs in a day, uh, maximum. When Frank Warrishai arrived out there and I went to meet him at the airport, just before the start of the tour when he was flying to Perth, we said, have a great tour, enjoy yourself. And he turned and walked back and he said, we'll have a lot of fun as well. And that set the tone for the whole of the series. Worrell's influence was evident in the opening test of the series at the Gabba, when he steered his team to a famous result in the first tied test in history. Up in Brisbane, you know, when I'd seen sides from the West Indies sort of get into a panic situation, Frank was the calmest bloke and that just had that complete composure, which, which really was marvellous for his team. That series was a wonderful series, and it obviously captured my imagination, but it captured the public's imagination as well. So, you know, I always had this very fond um, um, image of, of Worrell, because obviously it takes two captains to, uh, to, to make an entertaining series. So Richie Benno and, and Frank Worrell were uh, you know, played their part in, in making that a very famous series and, and, a, and a series that revived cricket and, and a series that made a young kid want to go out there and play the game even harder. In those days there was no such thing as a one day international cricket. Players weren't as schooled um, with the idea of, of chasing runs under pressure as they are today thanks to uh, one day matches that are played and so uh, it was a unique type of pressure which was brought to bear. Round skies him. Three of them, four of them getting under it. Cam High gets it and it's back. It's back. When Wes Hall was bowling that famous last over, and he himself, like Wes Hall, was getting all excited, he went back to his mark with, uh, I think it was 
uh, one run to win Australia and one wicket to get. And all he told Wes Hall was, don't bowl on the ball, else you could never go back to Barbados. That's all he told him. And um, of course, we know what the outcome was. And here's the single that wins the match for Australia. He's out, he's right out. Right out. He's coming to town down. Well, no, it's a tie. At the end of the match, uh, Richie Benner reflected with uh, Sir Donald Bradman, who was uh, Australia's chairman of selectors, what a waste it had been. And um, Bradman's uh, reputed to have said, don't worry about that, you'll find in time that this result uh, will do absolute wonders for Test Match cricket. And uh, Benner, of course, was reluctant to accept that at the time, but, but history has shown how right Bradman was. As the series unfolded, it seemed as though the two teams had reinvented Test cricket. All of a sudden, we've got, you know, sides that are, you know, that are getting on with the game. It was the best blood transfusion that, that you could ever give to the game of cricket. Everyone remembers the tied test, the first game of the series in Brisbane, but it really was five remarkable matches that were played. We had come here as the underdogs and we had performed extremely well. Um, we had lived up, I thought, to the expectations of our player, of our um, people at home, our spectators, the ones who expected us to do well. And I think that we, we excelled, we did really well. And I think that full credit sh um, should, should go to Sir Frank World, should have gone to Sir Frank World for that tour, because I think if we had had another captain, I don't think that we would have performed as well. It was the greatest series I've ever known, from teams fraternizing and getting on well together. Uh, same, fire, uh, same umpires for all five test matches, and uh, it, was just, it was just something that will never be forgotten. At the end of the series, the Australian Cricket Board of Control introduced a new trophy for the Australia West Indies Test Series, the Frank Worrell Trophy. To give you an indication of uh, the way the West Indian team were, were viewed in Australia, uh, they were given uh, motorcades through the city at the end of the tour, and indeed the trophy, uh, which is still played for between Australia and the West Indies to this day, uh, was created uh, at the end of that series, and that was the Frank Worrell Trophy. It was a, a marvellous tribute to him, whoever it was that decided that Frank was going to be the captain for that tour, or I can say it's the people in charge of West Indies cricket at that time, they, they made a marvellous decision. Frank Worrell led the West Indies in his final test series in England in 1963. He was seldom fully fit, but his captaincy was as effective as ever. Worrell retired after the series against England and was knighted a year later. He had sown the seeds that would blossom into the great West Indies teams of the 70s and 80s. The influence that Worrell had, it was demonstrated when he was captain, but also in the years immediately afterwards. Um, the West Indies between 1963 and, and 67 were clearly the best side in world cricket. Um, they beat England well, in 63, they beat England, they beat England again in England decisively in 1966. In between they beat Australia comfortably in the West Indies. And I mean they were a great side with, with Hall, Canhai, Sobers, Hunt, Griffiths, they, it was just a superb side. And again that one unit and that was a direct result of Worrell's influence. An absolutely outstanding captain. Uh, responsible for, for bringing on wonderful, wonderful cricketers like Gary Sobers. He was the one who, in the end, when he moved, recommended that Sobers be made a captain. Uh, Conrad Hunt was vice-captain under him, but uh, he recommended that Sobers take over from him because he knew how well Sobers read the game. They were very close and he, he actually moulded Sobers uh, in, in his time. I think he might have been the first person to, to sort of mould them as a team and I think that that carried through into the, you know, the Lloyd era and the Richards era. Uh, he gave them pride in themselves, uh, and uh, I, I think um, set an example that the other West Indies captain captains followed. He, you know, he just had great vision, and I, I've always respected him because he, he's somebody that you can talk to, and, and he's always giving you the right sort of 
your vibes really and he's very intelligent man he knew the game inside out and he was he he, he can manage people he's a man manager more or less you know and he would have you know he was a great captain a great player and a great manager and i thought that my job when i became captain was to continue his his wonderful work sir frank warrell died of leukemia in 1967 a memorial service was held for him at westminster abbey it was absolutely tragic that he died at the age of 43 because he would have been a great leader, a uh, political leader in the country, I think. I went to his funeral then uh, in um, Barbados when he was buried and the whole country came to a standstill. One just wonders what effect he would have had, what further effect he would have had on West Indies cricket as manager, probably as president of the board, as the overseer of West Indies cricket. It was a great loss. Sir Frank Worrell played in 51 test matches and scored 3,860 runs at an average of 49.48. He made nine centuries, and he took 69 test wickets at an average of 38.73 and held 43 catches. His statistics suggest that he was a good rather than a great test match cricketer, but his contribution to cricket and to the West Indies went much further than numbers in an almanac. As an ambassador for the game and for all he did for West Indies cricket, you can nearly mount a case that he's the most important cricketer of all time. Uh, an extraordinary man, selfless, um, but determined, uh, prepared to back a cause if he truly believed in it. Uh, a great representative of the black, the black man in the West Indies cricket and, and the West Indies. I just look upon the fact that he died age 42. He may well have evolved into one of the most important figures in Caribbean life had he lived to become a, perhaps a politician or whatever, or certainly an advocate for the West Indies people. Because the fact, you know, the West Indies have really only united in cricket. Away from cricket, they're very much separate nations. And I just wonder whether Worrell, being the great man that he was and the respect he had throughout the Caribbean, he may well have made a difference. Just in, and, I'm not, and I'm not talking cricket, I'm talking life. He was, he was that important. Well, it was a saint of some sort of sorts. He... Well, was the Nelson Mandela of cricket, I think. And I think he's really one of the great influences. A g very good cricketer, very good cricketer, but uh, um, the, the hull is more than the sum of the parts with Walt. Go back to 1951, when they were in Sydney, um, and I was collecting autographs then, and they got into the team bus, and I thought I'd missed him. I had weeks and I had Walcott, and I badly needed Worrell. And I, was, I can, what's that, 50 years ago, and I can still picture that dreamy face looking down from the high window on the bus, an old charabang thing, and I just stretched up with my book, and he reached down and he wrote, with best wishes, Frankie, Frankie Worrell, and handed it back with another dreamy smile, and uh, I was one from that moment on. Frank Worrell, statesman, captain, player, was of the highest standards. I don't know of any player I respected more in an opposition team ever as a person. Um, I've always said that he was capital S, capital I, capital R, Sir Frank. Sir Frank Worrell was a courageous and uncompromising fighter for equality. He was a hero for all West Indian people. He was one of the most significant figures in cricket in the 20th century and commands an honoured place amongst ESPN's Legends of Cricket. <laughs>